first come to earth, you got to take care of it. Then come the people, then each his fair share of it. Design for the earth, and you design for yourself. Help design a world better for you and everybody else. You're kind of inherently a visionary. You, maybe you don't even know it yet. You keep thinking that people don't understand you, and maybe they really don't. But that doesn't mean you're wrong. I think we got to experience that as a whole neighborhood. And it's not like we had a bunch of visionaries all in one place, but we happened upon an idea that frankly was a, was a visionary idea, but it was kind of like this hundredth monkey thing had happened where we all kind of got it at the same time. So the way it happened here was that we had been gathering for quite a long time under that beautiful conifer over there where we built this huge thousand square foot tea house. Very, very unusual. Um, like when you walked into the tea house, you didn't get this clue that most architecture expresses, which is that humanity and nature are separate. Professors actually sit architecture students, planners down in school and say, okay, now philosophically, you have to realize that what you're doing, what you've got to do, this is your job, this is what you've got to express, is that humanity and nature are separate. So we decided to junk that and just say, okay, we're looking for something pretty much opposite of everything we've experienced before. We don't really know what we're going to build or what it's going to look like, but we do know that it needs to work differently than that mentality. What you're seeing is kind of like what you'd see in some of the best public spaces in the world. Functionally, I mean. Like, when you go to a really good public plaza or piazza, like you've, you've seen in Mexico or Central America, um, there's always a place to sit. Because people want to see each other and look, look at each other and be seen. Um, but you'll also find that there's usually a place... Hey there! There's usually a place to get a drink, so we have our 24-hour tea station. So you're always going to be able to get a drink. And then there's a place for news. Our local paper is called the Selwood Bee, and so we have a beehive-shaped newspaper dispenser for the bee. Um, this is a place for information. This is our little library. And uh, more places to sit. Gardens. So it's, it's kind of amazing to just kind of look around and realize that everything here has a story. And some of them have layers of stories. Like a lot of the things that these are built out of came from buildings that were being torn down around here. Um, the use of branches came from dialogues where somebody was saying, hey, sh this, this should resemble historic architecture. And somebody else is like, yeah, but can it resemble the trees? They were here first. So, you know, usually there's a really rich discussion going on with each one of the pieces about what, how to do it and what story it should tell. Here's kind of the difference between a permacultural urban fabric and a typical grid. This was laid out, you know, all at once by somebody with a T-square and a triangle. And the landscape was flattened, the lines were drawn, and the place was sold off. And it doesn't, you know, you can't really tell, is this a neighborhood zone? Is this a commercial zone? It just kind of all starts off as a series of numerically interchangeable lots. But check out the difference when people are creating it for themselves. This is an aerial view of a Dogon village in Mali. At their block scale, you can see that they've prioritized their own relationships by locating an open space in the center of the block. Notice that in the National Land Ordinance, whoops, they just forgot to do that. This is how villages basically work. They start with common space and open space. That's the prototype block. And then here at the village scale, you have an intersection here, you have an intersection here, you have an intersection here, and up here, and here, and here. This all, I mean, it infuses the village. Everything is a social commons, even the pathways themselves. This is where people are gathering, communicating, celebrating, exchanging every day of the year. Our aspiring mayor had been a police chief. So he said, oh, okay, well, um, in the police academy, they tell us to just sit in the middle of an intersection um, if there's ever a domestic uh, um, uprising because you can see everything as, you know, as far as the eye can see because it's all been made as flat and straight as possible so that a policeman can see anybody gathering and you know so you can put down the unrest 
And that's exactly why it's set up this way. We're told at best that it's a real estate development, but you just look a little bit deeper and you find out the Greeks liked it because they could set it up even when they were fighting. It was so simple, you know. But they didn't just set it up as their own camp. Um, they wiped this out and built this on top of it out of the ruins of this. Now, I don't, I'm not bringing this up just to gripe about history. I want to point out that this thing is adapted to the landscape. It's a geomorphic settlement. It's morphed to the place. So it's designed to catch light and to catch water and to defend place against wind and create shade in all of these environments and times when you need it um, to hold water, to grow things, to keep us cool. Like, this is, this is a, adapted to the climate and the place. And um, this would be an, an, a basis, or these are the, sort of the large patterns for the basis of urban permaculture. This is what we have to retrofit with an awareness like this. This piece over here that you're going to see is the, um, we think it's the world's first 24-hour solar-powered self-service cat palace. <laughs> Cats are into, you know, solar power like everybody else. <laughs> We had a workshop with the kitties and they made sp certain special requests. The cats just kind of sit here on the catnip laced silk pillow <laughs> and paw at the aquarium. There's a lot of principles of solar design here, passive solar design that we've integrated into the tower. Like you can see, it's just a little bit afternoon and the comfy silk pillows and their stone thermal mass are well in the shade, but at, at a perfect angle, the sun slides right in here during the, the colder months of the year and warms up the space where the cats are sitting. This thing right here is actually a sun catcher. Sunlight goes into that prismatic sort of skylight there and washes down over your kitty up here on the 360 viewing platform. 